Welcome to our Bible study. Today we're going to continue with our mentoring series and we're going to see how Barnabas and Paul mentored together. It's a very interesting series that we've been discussing, I think, and I know that as we looked at some of the other ones like Moses and Jethro and um, and and um, and then uh, Joshua and Moses and Corn and then uh, we looked at uh, Mordecai and Esther um, and and we're going to pick that up here. We've got two more sessions on that, and today we're going to look at Barnabas, who was the encourager, and Paul. So if you have your lessons, or if you don't, it doesn't matter if you have a Bible, you can turn with me to um, Acts chapter 9, verse 26. Acts chapter 9, verse 26. And before we get into it, I want to give you a little introductory material that will help us, help you understand about Paul's missionary journeys and the book of Acts and how it was set up mainly to show how the gospel was carried through different types of peoples. And so we'll look at that quickly as we begin. So let's start with prayer. Thank you, Lord, for loving us and for watching after us, for caring for us, and for always being there for us. Help us, Lord, to be there for other people as you lead us to be encouragers and as you ask us to serve in whatever capacity that we may have, wherever we're called, in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so what I'm going to do is to start off, I'm going to turn this camera around and put it here on the screen that I've written. And you can see here, uh, let me move it up just a hair. So you can see the way the gospel was carried out. And we started off with uh, the Jews, the Jews in the Jewish church. Now you can find all this in Acts. And it starts off where the uh, disciples are in Jerusalem. They're afraid to leave and what have you. The Holy Spirit comes upon them and then they're willing and able to move out. But the Jews started in Jerusalem, and that was the very first part of the gospel because Jesus even said the gospel really came for the Jews. But as they found out, the Jews did not accept everything about the gospel. And so it was passed on by people like Barnabas and Paul to the Gentiles. So there was a church in Antioch. Uh, and this, this was the Jerusalem church here. Jerusalem church. And this was... Uh, was a church started in Antioch, which is in Syria, which is just a little bit north of Jerusalem. Uh, and so they were doing a ministry there, and the two churches would help each other out. And then you had the, the gospel moving to the God-fearers. And that was shown to us when uh, Peter was talking to Cornelius. He was talking to him about becoming a Christian, becoming a believer. And Cornelius said that he believed in God and that he loved God and feared God, but he didn't know about Jesus. And so we see the next barrier broken down, and that is the gospel was taken to the God-fearers, and that's Peter and Cornelius. And then the gospel was taken to non-believers. And that was done, you remember when Philip went down and he was, uh, by the Spirit, led him down to talk to the eunuch, and the eunuch said, I've just come from, you know, a, a worship service, and I don't understand what that means. I don't understand uh, when Isaiah was talking about salvation and about somebody who's going to come and bring salvation. And it said there that uh, Philip then talked to the eunuch and told him what that meant. So then you had the last barrier that was broken down, and the gospel was given to non-believers. So he goes from the Jewish church to the Gentile church to god fears and to non-believers. And that's that's a breakdown then of how the gospel was carried out from with the power of God to get to these various individuals. Now, let me uh, read uh, to you a couple a couple other things as I move over here, and I'm going to uh, switch this camera back on me. Uh, <clears throat> just to kind of give you a rundown on Paul's missionary journeys and kind of his life. It's very short here. I just wrote down some of the key issues. But it starts off that Paul persecutes Christians. You remember Paul? He was looking for Christians. He was going out to persecute them uh, and to turn them over to the authorities, the Jewish authorities, to have them stoned or whatever it may be, which was illegal. 
uh, as far as Rome went, but still Paul was trying to carry some of these things out. He was there when Stephen was martyred. Do you remember it said that, that Paul uh, actually held the uh, garments of some of the ones which showed that he approved. Uh, then on his way to Damascus, you know, that he had that blinding uh, experience. He was knocked from his horse and and Jesus said, uh, Saul, why do you persecute me? And he became a Christian on that road at that very moment. And he was told to go to, um, uh, to um, well, he was on his way to Damascus. So he was told to continue on his way, go to Damascus, and a man named Ananias will come and heal you. Because you remember, Paul was blinded whenever he had that uh, experience. And so uh, Ananias came to him and healed him from that. Uh, then then, uh, then he started preaching in Damascus, and the Jews didn't like it, so they threatened to kill him. In fact, they uh, had to help Paul escape from the city by his very life. The Christians lifted him over the wall in a basket. This is all in Acts. You can read it there and in, and in some of the other uh, epistles. Uh, then then uh, he stayed in Damascus about... Um, uh, well, he, he, he returned to Jerusalem. He stayed in Damascus as long as he could until his life was, was just really pushed. He was pushed to get out. He went back to Jerusalem, and that's when uh, he went into the Jerusalem church, tried to become a member of the church, and they were afraid of him. And somebody stepped forward named Barnabas, and we'll look at that. And Barnabas, uh, it, with the encourager, said that... Um, took Paul's side, and we'll look at that a little bit closer. But anyway, they accepted him into the church then. Uh, and then then he went to Tarsus, actually. Paul did for about 10 years. Those are known as the quiet years. We don't really know what happened during that time, but uh, Tarsus is where Paul was from. So he went back there maybe for more training or whatever it was. Uh, and then uh, Barnabas searched him out because they, he wanted to go on a missionary journey. And that's when Paul and Barnabas and John Mark went. Uh, and then they went, so they traveled to Antioch and uh, to, and they, they got some... Uh, uh, offering from the church at Antioch to take to the Jerusalem church to help them, you know, with food and, and other problems. So they went there, and then they both returned to Antioch, uh, that is Paul and Barnabas. You remember during the first missionary journey, um, Mark, John Mark, who became the writer of the of Mark, of that gospel of Mark, dropped out. We don't know why, we don't know what happened, where he went why he left, what have you. But it made Paul mad because when they set out for the second missionary journey, Paul said, I don't want Timothy coming. I don't want um, John Mark coming with us. And um, Barnabas said, yes, he, he needs to come with us. And they had such a problem that they split company. And Paul and Silas went one way and Barnabas and and uh, John Mark went another way. So that's that's just kind of a little, a little introductory to kind of put it, pin it to this skeleton that we're going to look at here. So it said in verse 26, when he arrived in Jerusalem, he tried to join the disciples, but they were all afraid of him since they did not believe that he was a disciple. So I've already talked about that just a little bit in the introductory remarks. He was having some problems there, but then somebody stepped forward, the encourager named Barnabas. Uh, now, uh, one of one of the, the uh, things that I want to hang up on the board, one of the, the one of, one of the statements that help us bring this to life is that uh, everyone can encourage. You know, everyone can be an encourager. Everyone can encourage. And I'm going to uh, put that up on the board. I'm going to pull it around here now since, since we don't need it over there. I'm going to pull it around here and I'm going to put that up there on the board. So everyone can be an encourager. Some people are better than others, better at it than others. Uh, you, you, have, you know, it kind of takes a talent. One thing you have to do in order to be a good encourager is you have to be humble. Uh, you know, you have to tell other people about the good points of somebody else. And when you do that, sometimes it makes you not, not look quite as good. Uh, in, in, in the eyes of those individuals, you know, that you're talking to, because if you're lifting them up, uh, then it may kind of move you down a little bit, but that's okay. That's where humility comes in. Uh, some people are uh, good encouragers because they're humble and uh, they are shrewd. You know, they see uh, in other people that they can, for the overall good of the company or overall good of the group, to encourage individuals and to stand up for them and to move them up. 
Now you have a lot of uh, CEOs and other uh, managers, maybe you were in charge or you were under a manager or foreman who wanted to get all the credit and therefore they did not share their, their uh, uh, the possibilities with you uh, of new ideas and they wanted to keep them all to themselves because they, they were you know afraid that if they gave you that notoriety that it would hurt them, you may even pass them up. Uh, I remember when I used to work and I came up with different idea for a particular uh, process that we used in cu couplings and I came up with the idea and um, my manager took it before the board and did not include me because he wanted to get the credit I guess I'm not sure but I guess that's what happened but that happens a lot and you just kind of grin and bear it whenever that happens there's nothing you can do but but if you are a good encourager, you can lift people up in the ranks and it makes you look good when you bring somebody up who uh, is successful. Um, so anyway, in order to be an encourager, you have to be a humble individual. You have to be uh, walk close to the Lord. You know, you have to be willing to give of yourself for others, even use up some of yourself for others to where uh, maybe your candle won't shine quite as brightly as it did before. Because uh, Barnabas, as you see here, was the uh, shining light for Paul and helped him become established and Paul surpassed him. I mean, uh, after we're finished with our lessons today, we don't even see Barnabas anymore. He's not in Acts any longer like Paul was and wrote all the other letters. So, so Barnabas could really take credit for all these things that Paul did to a degree because he helped him get his foot in the church, which helped him to go into missionary journeys, which helped him to write all these books that we're able to read now and these letters that we're able to read now and enlighten us. So even though that Paul was uh, instrumental in all this, Barnabas was the one at the very beginning that gave him that encouragement. And so we need to keep that in mind when we are being a servant in the church you know we're there to lift other people up it doesn't make any difference if that you know how, how that reflects on us it should only reflect good on us because uh, if we're doing god's work and we um, if god tells us to uh, that uh, here's somebody who's capable of doing this or that then you need to move forward with it uh, okay so that's that's uh, those those verses let's go to the next ones it says verse 27 barnabas however took him took Paul and brought him to the apostles. Now the apostles are the ones who saw the risen Christ. Uh, disciples were those that followed Jesus, but there was a subset of the disciples called apostles. And they were the ones that saw the risen Christ. Um, and so anyway, um, so he took them to the apostles, which they basically were the leaders of the church, and explained to them how Saul, which is the Roman name for, uh, for Paul, uh, the Jewish name Paul, Roman name Saul. So kind of depending on where Paul was, he would use Saul or Paul. Anyway, uh, Saul had seen the Lord on the road and, and that the Lord had talked to him and how in Damascus he had spoken boldly in the name of Jesus. So the proof then that Barnabas has as he makes uh, Paul's case is that is that um, uh, not only did Paul see the risen Christ and basically you know uh, defined him now as an apostle as well, uh, but he also lived it out. If you, you know, you have to walk the talk. You have to, to even as a Christian, when you make a test, when you state a testimony or uh, a principle uh, of, of Christianity or what have you, nobody's going to believe you unless they can see it in your life. You can tell people how much you love them and how committed you are to serving them, but if you don't do it, they're not going to believe it. And so Barnabas said, Paul not only said he was a Christian, became a Christian, but you can see it in the actions because he began to preach all over Damascus and was persecuted for it. And so now he comes before you asking to join you know, us at this particular juncture in, in his ministry. Uh, and then, uh, then we, uh, your lesson then switches over to Acts chapter 11. And it said, news about them reached the church in Jerusalem, and they sent out Barnabas to travel as far as Antioch. When he arrived and saw the grace of God, he was glad and encouraged all of them to remain true to the Lord with devoted hearts. So Barnabas has gone to Antioch uh, as well as Paul. They reached uh, up there. They left from Jerusalem and they saw how good that the churches were doing there. And they saw the blessings that God had placed upon these people. 
and they were overjoyed at what God had done uh, through them for these particular churches. And you notice it said news about them reached the church in Jerusalem. In other words, that they had gotten to Antioch and what was going on. Uh, and then they sent out Barnabas to travel as far as Antioch when he arrived and saw the grace of God. So he saw he saw God's grace in this church. He saw uh, that these people were saved. They were Christians, not based on what they did, but just simply because God, in his merciful goodness, reached out to them and offered them salvation, and they accepted it. And so he said, for the grace of God. Uh, and he was glad, and he encouraged them to remain to the Lord with devoted hearts. So Barnabas saw what was going on. He said, yes, uh, I can see that these people have not uh, uh, deterred from the doctrinal statement, the doctrinal truth that works doesn't get you to heaven. But salvation comes through Jesus Christ and through faith in him and through the grace that he gives that, that he gives to us then works will follow that because your life will be changed just like Paul his life was changed after he made that decision on the road to Damascus to accept Christ into his life and he showed it by being a disciple um, and then in verse 24 it says for he was a good man full of the Holy Spirit and of faith and large numbers of people were added to the Lord so talking about Barnabas, he was a good man. You know, he was a good encourager. He was a good Christian man. He was willing to do whatever it took to spread the gospel to wherever, you know, it needed to go. And we see earlier in, in the, the uh, book of Acts that Barnabas showed up at the Christian community and he sold a, a lot of his goods and possessions and gave them to the church so that they may uh, use them in order to further the gospel. So Barnabas was a good man. He was an encourager. He had a good reputation. Uh, he was a humble individual. Uh, he saw, you know, because he was, you know, smart enough and spiritually enlightened enough, he saw in people the very potential that they had to taking the gospel to the next step. And he saw that potential in Timothy, and he saw that potential in Paul, and he saw that potential in Silas, and he saw that potential in John Mark, and he saw that potential in many other people. And because of that, his ministry flourished through others. And that's another thing that this a lesson tells us and we'll get into that in just a minute too in verse 25 uh, Barnabas said well now you know I need to uh, take care of uh, the, the missions the ministry and I need to go back to the churches that I came from or we need to set up some new churches and I need a helper and you remember Paul so it said he went to uh, Tarsus in verse 25 then he went to, to Tarsus to search for Saul uh, Saul was from Tarsus. You, you know that Paul came from Tarsus. Tarsus was a it was the third largest city in the Roman Empire. It was uh, uh, known for its education and edu you know it, it was it was a um, it, it was a seat of knowledge. And uh, we know how smart Paul was. You can tell by the writings that he had. Also, he was steeped in the Jewish traditions and in the Bible and the Old Testament and prophets and all that. And he studied under some of the greatest uh, Pharisees. And so Paul himself was a Pharisee. So he was very intelligent. And he was a, a weapon that God had given uh, every, that given to him everything that he needed to carry out his ministry. He was intelligent. He was smart. He was motivated. Uh, he was persistent. Uh, he was full of faith. He was full of fire. He was full of vigor. He was not going to give up. He ended up dying in prison. Uh, in prison, well, for, he was in prison, but they had him executed. Um, the Roman government did, so uh, he was true to the end. That's the kind of a man that Paul was. In verse 26, and when he found him, when he, when he found Paul, when Barnabas found Paul, he brought him to Antioch. And so for a whole year, they met with the church and taught large numbers. The disciples were first called Christians at Antioch. <laughs> Uh, so we see here a little window of what's going on. Barnabas gets to Antioch. He finds uh, to Tarsus. I mean, he finds Paul and he says, come with me to Antioch. We need to strengthen the churches there. We need to strengthen and get more people there. So they went to Antioch. And what verse 26 says is that they were there for a whole year. Uh, they met the churches, etc. And they grew in large numbers. And it was then that the Christians or that the people that were part of the, this Christ movement uh, were... Uh, known as, as Christians as for the first time, according to the book of Acts. Christians was a derogatory uh, comment at first. Uh, you know, the Jews used it, you know, Christians, you know, kind of made fun of them, etc. 
but that term stuck and it was an important term and the Christians thought that was a good term to describe their movement so they became Christians and uh, that's what they called themselves from this time on okay uh, verse uh, then we then we move to Acts um, to Acts 15 and it says after some time had passed Paul said to Barnabas let's go back and visit the brothers and sisters in every town where we have preached the word of the Lord and see how they're doing and so they uh, thought well yeah you know that would be a good idea let's go back and let's see if they're being doctrinally sound let's make sure that they're doing what they're supposed to be doing you know they need a little encouragement so they said yeah let's go back and see what they're doing and make sure that the um, the, the policies that they have within the early church are are within uh, you know the uh, right standards that are set up by the uh, Jerusalem church basically and we'll look at that too at next week uh, probably in next week's time but but it, but anyway and so they were um, you know just going back and making sure they were still preaching the gospel and everybody you know and, and th things haven't wavered and all and we know that in Paul's writings that in a lot of these churches he went back to they were preaching false doctrines you know they had slipped and they were not t teaching and acting the right way and Paul would reprimand them in these letters um, and so they they went back to these churches to uh, at least to Antioch at this time then they later they started going back to more churches but they went to Antioch at this time uh, and then uh, verse 36 um, Paul and I mentioned this Paul and Barnabas they decided to leave Antioch and just go to all the churches that they had established and make sure things were still going okay and then verse 37 it says Barnabas wanted to take along John who was called Mark. Now he was Barnabas, as Mark was Barnabas's cousin, as we find out. Uh, but, but also Barnabas wanted to include John Mark in these next ministries, these next missionary, this, his next missionary trip. Uh, Paul said, no, I don't want him because he uh, left us after the first mission, right in the middle of our first missionary journey, he walked out on us. So Paul kind of held a grudge and you know, nobody's perfect. Paul held a grudge and he did, he did not want to put up with him anymore. Barnabas is willing to forgive and to move forward from that point, but not not Paul. In fact, it was they had such an argument that they split. You know that it, you know together they split, uh, which which can be a good thing. You know if it holds together. Uh, there are a lot of churches that have had arguments, and because of that, they split and started another church. And many times, both churches grew after that because if a church is so large, uh, it's only going to grow so big. Uh, and sometimes if you split up and you start a church, that's why, you know, we have different missions and stuff. Uh, Northside was a mission of Severance Valley. Uh, Severance Valley thought, you know, we could get people to come all over Elizabethtown, but why wouldn't we just start a mission to where people who live in that particular community, because there were a lot of homes and it was, the population was building there, uh, start another church that they could attend that church. And so uh, Northside was established as a mission uh, and they have grown from there. And that's what Paul and Barnabas were doing. They were setting up churches in different areas. And when they had this uh, disagreement, the two of them split. Well, that just made uh, the Christian movement grow faster because uh, both Barnabas and Saul went their own ways in different areas, in different towns, in different directions. And they were able to produce twice as many churches as they normally would have been. So splitting up is not necessarily a bad thing, uh, even if it's for the wrong motive. A lot of times it will, uh, with God's blessings on it, things will get turned around and it will uh, you know, become uh, more vibrant for the glory of God. And so that's what we have here. Paul insisted they should not take along, uh, take along this man who deserted them in Pamphylia. And then verse 39, which is our last verse, it said they had such a sharp disagreement that they parted company and Barnabas took Mark with him and sailed off to Cyprus. But Paul chose Silas and departed after being commended by the brothers and sisters to the grace of God. So you can kind of see how these two individuals went in their own ways. Um, and, you know, even if it was on an argument that that uh, maybe was not, you know, uh, uh, didn't show the love that they should have had for each other. It's still, God was able to use it uh, because uh, we see that these churches were established twice as fast as normal. So so let's let, let's look at a, a, just a couple things here. Uh, we looked at everyone can encourage, everyone can be an encourager. Let me move this up just a little bit. 
so everyone can be an encourager. And then secondly, ministries are not the same. You know, Paul said in 1 Corinthians that everybody is given different gifts and everybody's gift is just as important as the next person's. And we are giving the, given those gifts because we all have particular ministries. And Paul had a ministry. Saul had a ministry. We'll find out that Timothy had a ministry. Silas had a particular ministry. The uh, apostles who stayed in Jerusalem had a ministry. Uh, you know, all God's people uh, are called into doing uh, particular ministries. The gifts that Acts uh, talks about, uh, I'm sorry, they're actually in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Well, actually 12 and 13. They, they actually talk about the different gifts that people have. It could be a gift of stewardship. It could be a gift of encouragement. It could a gift, be a gift of discernment. It could be a gift of tithing. It could be a gift of prophesying. It could be a gift of preaching. It could be a gift of, of teaching, you know, and, and on and on. So there's uh, 12 or 13 gifts that uh, God gives to the church, to the people in the church, to help motivate the church. So all ministries are not the same. So you have a particular ministry, you have a particular gift, and you could you, you should use that to uh, minister in the church that you are a member. Uh, whether you're a member of Northside or somewhere else, you should use that in order to minister to the people and to use that gift and that talent that God has given to you to help because you're the only one that can do it effectively, uh, you know, as effectively. Uh, then, then, uh, then we find out in this too that there's a time to let go. You know, Barnabas, he, um, he was very faithful to mentoring Paul, and they worked together, etc. He stood by him, he encouraged him, but there was a time to let go. You know, finally Paul said, I want to go on my own, and we just have to know that, 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 that God loves us enough that he's going to give us the strength that we need to just let go, kind of like when you're a parent and your child, you know, basically what you're supposed to do as a parent is make your child dependent, so uh, independent, so they can live on, he or she can live on his own. Um, that's basically what parenting is all about. Uh, and when that time comes, some people, uh, you know, have problems with that when their child leaves and, and when they're on their own, and some see it as success. And that's what we're supposed to look at here as far as what Paul was talking about, what Barnabas was talking about. There is a time when we need to quit mentoring uh, at least one-on-one, -on -one, a very close contact, and let the person leave, let the person go on. You know, if you're in the military and they teach you how to do all these things, how to jump out of an airplane, how to shoot a rifle, how to shoot a gun, uh, there comes a time in combat that you're on your own. You know, they're not, you're not going to be with those pe same people all the time. And there comes a time that the people who trained you are not going to be with you during those times, and you just have to draw on that training and draw on that experience and that education and knowledge that they have given you. Okay, and then lastly, we see here that disciples need to disciple. Disciples need to disciple. And they move that down just a hair. So disciples need to disciple. So we have that everyone can encourage. Ministries are not the same. There is a time to let go and disciples need to disciple. Um, if you become a Christian, you need to become a disciple immediately as far as uh, learning about what God and, you know, through Jesus Christ, um, how you can be uh, all that God wants you to be, all that he's called you to be. You need to find out what your gifts are. You need to use the fruit, the fruit of the Spirit in your life. You need to, you know, find out the mechanics of the church and how they, how it works and, and, um, and utilize those things and reach out to minister to other people who, um, you know, are new. You have some people in church that never grow. You know, they are they become disciples to a degree. They kind of fizzle out. They study a little bit and they get tired of it or they never even start because they don't know they're supposed to. But that's when you come in. If you're a Christian, that's where you come in and you say, okay, I am a disciple. Uh, I became a Christian. I'm a disciple. Uh, somebody's discipled me. Uh, or, I, you know, I re read the Bible and I go to Bible studies and, and I learn more about the Christian faith. And now it's time for me to step out and to pick up somebody else who is 
just kind of wavering. Sometimes there'll be um, a, a person who's baptized and they may be single and they have just come to church and they found out some truths and all and they get baptized and then uh, people just kind of drop them and they drop through the cracks and they leave and you never see them again. Uh, that's just the very beginning of their discipleship. That that's certainly is not the end of it. And that's when you as a Christian and as a good church member need to step up and say, uh, I'm going to take a, a personal interest in this individual and call them and invite them out to eat or have them to your home or go visit them uh, or offer them, you know, discipleship training, you know, that you'll help them. Uh, if, at least as much as you know, you may not know a lot, but you know more than they do. And so you can, you know, work and grow together. So whatever it is, that's basically what our lesson is talking about today. So we're going to go ahead then and we're going to close in prayer. And I appreciate and thank you all for being here and for being part of our Bible study today. Thank you, Lord, for showing us through Paul and Barnabas and some of these other missionary uh, missionaries and the journeys that they take. Uh, thank you for showing us through them how we too can be a missionary, how we too can reach out and touch individuals' lives. Thank you for giving us insights into your word. Thank you, Lord, for allowing us to feel the salvation and love of Jesus Christ and how it changed us and how through that we can be mentors and change others. And these things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.